uh, your channel where we meet with CEOs, uh, business owners, different types of advisors uh, from attorneys to CPAs. Uh, and today uh, I wanted to welcome Alex Carini, which is the founder and the CEO of a boutique real estate real estate firm headquartered here in New York City. Alex Carini, welcome to the channel. Thank you for having me, Gene. Absolutely. Truly a pleasure having you, Alex. I, I have known you for the last about, what, four, four and a half years. Uh, time does fly so, um, so, so very fast. Uh, I, I think you're one of the examples of, um, you know, those uh, truly American success stories where the people came from uh, overseas to America, you know, trying to make something out of nothing. And I think you exemplify, uh, you know, an individual who, you know, comes here, you know, works very hard, you know, rolling his sleeves and really creating a very nice, uh, very meaningful business. So uh, let's talk uh, to our audience about how you got to the U.S., how you got involved in the real estate business. I think it's a pretty fascinating story. Go ahead, please. Well, th thank you, Jim, for the for the compliments, and uh, definitely, um, I do have an immigrant story, as as they call it. And originally, I'm just like from, myself. Uh, Italy. Uh, I'm sorry. I said just like myself. I also came here, as you know. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's why. Uh, that's why we connect very well. So. Absolutely. So I originally came from Italy here. I initially went to school in Boston, studying international business. Now, when I, when I say initially, I mean I was uh, 19 years old, part of a double degree program, they call it. So I started my school in, in Europe, in Italy in particular, and then coming here to Boston. And, you know, when you are 19, 20, 21, 22, I graduated, you have no idea what you want to do, truthfully. And, um, you know, my family is in business as well, actually in the real estate business as well, in, in, in Italy and Spain. Um, and so, you know, you try and see what, uh, what you're most, uh, you know, um, what you have more affinity towards and so on and so forth. My passion for real estate really came when uh, I decided to move to New York City. And um, um, New York City is famous for buildings mainly and so very, i came very, here very I, rises, I, indeed attracts people from all over <laughs> right right that's right and uh and so i tried uh, simply to match my background in international business uh having lived and uh, been and speaking um you know in different countries different languages um to to, to what uh, new york city had to offer so a vibrant uh, international market uh real estate is one of the top uh uh, market uh, for New York City, but for the whole world, as far as uh, profitability, um, with finance, insurance, and other sectors, and uh, you know, in real estate, there's a certain human aspect of people that buy real estate and uh, manage it and live there with their family. When you're talking about residential, or even when you talk about commercial, um, uh, you know, st uh, starting and uh, expanding their own business. So there's there's a certain aspect of real estate that I really uh, loved. And, um, you know, now fast forward uh, many years uh, in the industry, uh, I own a res residential brokerage company in New York City and also a commercial uh, brokerage company also based in New York City. So we are um, uh, involved in a variety of uh, real estate uh, transactions, buying, selling and renting of individual luxury apartments, especially when it comes to Manhattan and, uh, and New York City. Um, in general and uh, commercial, we do the same with buildings and uh, retail spaces, leasing and office leasing. Um, as far as uh, domestically, uh, being that we work with a lot of international clients that come here and invest in, um, of course, in real estate from all over the world, really, Western Europe, South America, but also Asia, Middle East. Um, we uh, also are present and cover the Miami market, especially, and the Los Angeles market as well. And on a case by case, also we've done other cities like Boston, Chicago, etc. So you that's a little bit of me in a nutshell. Well, that that's quite a story. Uh, so it, it definitely helps coming from the family background because my understanding is that even before you moved to the U.S., you have done some uh, some smaller deals or you had some involvement in different shapes and forms as far as real estate transactions, be it renting, you know, leasing. Uh, you know, probably not at the same magnitude that you are operating nowadays. Uh, but I mean, hey, you know, kudos to you. You definitely have uh, created a very nice, reputable company that has been helping uh, people from all over the world. And uh, the fact that you do have this international background, the fact that you speak uh, multiple uh, European languages, you grew up in both uh, Spain and Italy, correct, if I recall correctly? Absolutely. I was born in Spain, actually. I grew up in Italy. My family had the business in both countries. And, um, and I've been back and forth between both countries, being raised in Italy from Italian family, you know, I would say uh, mostly, uh, but always back and forth until I came to America at about uh, 20 years old. Gotcha. 
Well, uh, again, uh, the, the fact that you've been transacting business when so many companies have been depressed or had to shut down the doors, uh, that speaks volumes. So again, speaking about this uh, insane predicament that not just the US, not just Europe, but the whole world has been going through over the last you know, eight, nine months, this COVID-19, how, how has it been impacting your business, Alex? Obviously, a lot of your international clients have been unable to travel here uh, to make selection of properties once you identify whatever kind of uh, you know, potential uh, uh, acquisition uh, projects they would be interested in. So how has it been impacting your business, uh, your practice? You know, please elaborate on that. Absolutely. And uh, uh, this is a very relevant question, of course. And uh, we, we, we ask this question every day and everything is evolving, as you know. So this is uh, by any means, you know, unprecedented, right? So nobody has, uh, nobody has, uh, doesn't have any kind of experience when it right. comes to, to dealing with something like, like this. And, uh, you know, the business has definitely been effective, affected, I'm sorry, right. um, uh, in a way that, especially in your, being based in New York City, I remember this started around March, middle of March, if I, if I recall correctly, for about uh, at least two months, we weren't able to show properties in New York City, uh, mandated by the state. There was well, a ban had showing properties. Down, absolutely. Property. It was, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So even if you wanted to, being that we we're part of the Real Estate Board of New York, there's very strict guidelines and so on and so forth. So the market has really literally paused uh, especially in the early part of this uh, uh, pandemic for about two, three months where, you know, listing sites weren't listing the, the days on the market anymore, which is one of the main, as you know, um, you know, factor and parameters. Uh, so everything really paused and there were a lot of questions as to where we're going and, and so on and so forth. Now, a couple of things happened. I would say, number one, of course, the international investment has been limited, uh, mainly because uh, people couldn't travel from overseas. Uh, and still are very limited in traveling. Um, so this has, has really been difficult to navigate. Um, on the residential side, I would say many, many fewer listings were on the market, about a third from uh, prior year, uh, month over month, year over year, right, uh, from a year ago. Um, so very few, very limited, um, very limited supply. Uh, a little bit of a less demand because of the international market being not so present. Uh, but curiously, because of that, coupled up, as you know very well, with the, with the historical low, uh, record low interest rates, that created a, a, a fun combination of actually a very um, intense activity once the market was reopened and once we were able to, to show properties again. Now, as you may have heard, of course, one of the big, big trends were people leaving the city and, and living the urban centers in general in America, but specifically New York, and heading over into the suburbs, right? And because we cover, we cover certain, uh, certain suburbs markets, such as the Hamptons, the Hamptons market was on fire. Uh, you were seeing 10, 15% above asking uh, accepted offers. So it was a very quick market transition uh, where a lot of families, a lot of well-to-do New Yorkers uh, decided to, to, to really pump up money in the, in, the, in the suburbs market. At the same time, the city saw a, an exodus um, outside different areas, Florida as well, um, some to California. Uh, and so that created a, a, a tough time, especially for rentals, I would say, in the New York City market, where owners and, and, uh, and landlords have really uh, needed to give uh, strong, strong, um, um, strong concessions, as we call them, to be able to rent their, their apartments and, and their properties in general and, uh, and stores. And so the levels to which we've never seen since 20, uh, 2011, so the rentals really, the rental market really came down. And as a consequence, also the, the sales market, um, we're definitely in a strong buyer's market at this time, but uh, sales market always follows, I say, the rental market where the rental market, you, you, you perceive it right away because if you're talking about residential, an apartment is either, is either empty or is rented, right? And it's the market of today. Right. The tenant is not, gonna, is not gonna wait. You're gonna see the effects right away. Usually the sales market follows a little bit. And now we are in that market where market is open, meaning you can openly trade, properties can go on the market. And so we're seeing very interesting discount and what I called discretionary pricing at this time where there's really little rationale to it, to the point that, um, you know, they always ask you, what's the discount right now? What, uh, what deal can you make? Well, I would answer that it's, it's very individualized and case by case 
transactions where truthfully, if you are dealing with an owner or a seller that is over leveraged at this time, you may see pricing very, very different. Of course, more aggressive on the, on the low end, meaning you can get a better deal in that case. And there's some owners that uh, they don't have to sell, so they're, they're still uh, uh, holding off strong and maybe renting those properties and give it a year or two, right? So we're seeing and everything in between. But we're very strong with buyers right now. So to answer your question, how has our business been? Our business has been busier than ever. You'd be surprised to hear. Uh, we've kept all our uh, agents and actually we've hired a few more during the pandemic. Uh, we've definitely shifted towards a buyer's market. So we represent a lot of buyers and we still are in this market. And um, every time, you know, there's, there's um, all the time saying that every time the, the river is moved, it's a good thing, thing for the fishermen. So definitely there's a lot of movement in the river right now for in, in a way or in another. And uh, a lot of people are taking advantage of it. Those are excellent points, Alex, you are making that, again, the market dictates the pricing, either it's, uh, you know, retail market or commercial market, uh, residential, uh, you know, commercial, uh, either you're looking to rent, you're looking to buy or sell. Uh, it's amazing to see some prices that came down dramatically on the sell side, uh, you know, especially the commercial properties, which a lot of times are decimated. I mean, you're looking at the vacancy rate of, you know, 40, 50, sometimes as high as 60, if not high percent. Uh, and as you said, hey, you know, if you as an owner, if you're leveraged, especially leveraged heavily, then you're really forced to liquidate some of those assets. So if somebody is looking for, for an acquisition in a certain area of the market, you know, certain type of properties, asset classes, then obviously it presents an yes. incredible buying opportunities. Uh, across, across the board, uh, uh, and you're right in New York City, though I do have an office in New York and I'm still, uh, you know, uh, using it uh, very um, sporadically, if you will, uh, but I I've been working pretty much out of Long Island. But since you're in Manhattan on a regular basis, what on the average uh, uh, kind of discounts you're seeing being offered on residential and commercial properties? Just, you know, the spread of numbers. Obviously, it depends on the cases. As you said, it really depends on how much you're willing to, to sell it, you know, as soon as possible to get hold sure. of cash. Uh, very good question. Um, it varies greatly, greatly by neighborhood, by asset type. But to give you, you know, a, a very general answer, if we're talking about residential, residential has hold off, hold better the value than commercial properties. I do agree with you on that, absolutely. So in, in Manhattan, which is definitely the time to buy right now, especially because other bars have been doing great. Brooklyn has, has been doing well. Queens has been doing well. Uh, Manhattan is because of the office, as you mentioned, you're not in the office. There's about 10% office spaces occupied right now. 10%. Right. So New York City is a, is a city of jobs and city of offices. If people are not here to work, then everything it's like comes a ghost down. Town. Whenever I go to Manhattan, yeah, I mean, it's like nobody out there. Yep. Absolutely, yes. So I would, I would answer on the residential side, we've seen discounts between 5% and 20%. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wide range and it really depends on price points. If you're talking below the million dollar mark, okay, which New York City can buy your one, perhaps two bedroom, uh, still very competitive. You'll be surprised. We, we've heard some, uh, we've had some bidding wars as well in that, uh, in that market. Now, when you're looking at $2 million and above, that's when you see deep discounts uh, progressionally. So the more you go up to five million, uh, even more on the luxury side, and there you're seeing 20% discounts um, on, um, on, on a regular basis. Um, so it's really, it's really, it's really what price point you are now talking about, um, commercial properties. We've seen definitely steeper discounts in commercial properties, depending on, um, on what it is. So it's a, if it's a multifamily on, you know, entry level apartments, studios and one bedroom that are rented out, you know, typical New York building, th they, they've been holding pretty strong, I would say. Uh, now, when you have a, a, a restaurant, because of what's going on in restaurants right now, they only open 25% for what, two, three weeks. They were closed before then and just had the outside part. So there you, you can see discounts uh, of about 20, uh, sometimes I hate to say, but 30, 35%. I say it's safe for landlords and sellers, uh, really depending on personal situation. Uh, it, it's fascinating because, as you stated, this is really a predicament that we have never been in where on the one hand, we're seeing incredible number of businesses, you know, shutting down their doors and vacating the space. Uh, so the properties are available at incredibly, you know, great discounts. But at the same time, we're seeing so many people, you know, who lost their jobs. They don't know when the next paycheck is going to be coming and where it's going to be coming from. And if you're fortunate to still hold on to your business, you don't really know what the environment is going to be, you know, next, uh, next month and next quarter. 
So you and I were on the same page as far as being optimists, you know, and positive thinkers, because otherwise, you know, it's not worth living our lives, I guess. But at the same time, you know, I can totally understand the concern of the people trying to wait, uh, you know, until better times get in. And you have been through different market cycles, Alex, so you know well that it, it's impossible to time the market. And, and in my experience as both financial advisor and real estate professional, I know that whenever I can see a discount of, you know, 10, 15, right. 20%, that's a great deal. And as you stated, the deals are being offered at, uh, you know, even higher discounts, you know, better, better discounts as far as, you know, 35%, sometimes and more than that. So even if the market dips, you know, from, from these levels, we know that as an investor, as a buyer of that property, being it residential or investment property or commercial buyers, they're gonna be probably in a better position two, three years from now than they would be otherwise, correct? So I would like you to expand and elaborate on your personal practice and working with the clients, especially overseas clients. Absolutely. So, so let me clear the field and then be, be very clear on what, what, my, what the most important thing is and what my, what, uh, my vision is. I am 125 percent uh, towards New York coming back. Just to be very clear, I have no doubt that New York will, will come back. And um, um, I do think that right now we have a lot of things that are playing into this. Uh, number one being the pandemic, number two being election year. Every time you know forget about the pandemic, every time we had you know elections, the market tend to paralyze a little bit because they for whatever reason, they, they want to see what happens next. This year right. we're also waiting for vaccine and uh, you know, something that will come down the market as far as the virus um, and political instability and, and et cetera. So I think all of this uh, definitely plays out in all that's happening. Now, if, you, if you're asking me what's going to happen in a year time, two year time, you know, when we're talking 2021, 2022, and, and you know, everybody buys real estate for the long haul, right? They, they take 30 year mortgages. They, they, they have uh, long vision terms. So if you're asking me 2022, three, four, five, I have no doubt then New York City will come back very, very strong and possibly stronger than it ever, than it ever was. Um, no doubt in my mind about that. Now, what that creates is, um, from how I see it, a short term, a short window of opportunity. Don't ask me how long it's gonna last. It could be that it lasts you know, another year, it could be the next another two months. You really don't know what's happening and I don't think nobody knows. What we do know, what we do know uh, currently is that there's a lot of uncertainty. And when there's a lot of uncertainty, if you have uh, a clear bet or a clear vision as to what you want to do with the asset, meaning keeping it. And the, for example, you're betting on, on New York City coming back strong, then it's a fantastic time to buy. Now, to answer your question, time in the market. I'm not a fan of time in the market either. Uh, time in the market either. And I tell you more, I always try to stay away from very generalized and um, you know, real estate analysis. Why? Real estate is not a stock, okay? And real estate is very individualized situation for a number of reasons. Could be location, could be floor, could be view, could be personal situation, could be leverage, could be... So it's very, very hard to give a blanket statement, especially in real estate. What I would say is that when people ask me, is it a good time to buy now? I tell them that it was a good time already six, nine months ago. So not necessarily you're going to get a better deal now or in the next six months versus what you would have gotten three months ago. It depends who you're dealing with and what deal you're dealing with. If the person that, um, you know, was selling, his personal situation got better throughout this, and it could be m m many reasons. You know, inter um, internet companies, for example, are doing well, very well, I understand, They're even better than usual. So it really depends what you're dealing with. I do think that we, we were in a bias market already for uh, – uh, a good part of two years, if not going on three, the height of the market was uh, 2016, end of 2016, if you were to ask me. And uh, since that point on, it, it became more of a buyer's market traditionally. And this uh, uh, pandemic definitely has moved the, the, the swing, uh, the pendulum, swing the pendulum towards more of a buyer's market. Now, it is a time, if you are looking to buy, to buy right now. As you heard, uh, the, the Fed has kept interest to zero for the next uh, a uh, few years, so they know that this is the time to do it. So mortgages are super uh, aggressive. So it's basically free money. And from there, you just have to find a good deal. Uh, I completely agree with you, Alex, in respect of the fact that, hey, you know, nobody has the crystal ball. Nobody can make any kind of predictions, especially the real estate, uh, you know, especially in New York City and Manhattan itself, because it's not in by area to area. It's not in from zip code to zip code. It's really from building to building on the same block. You can have 
to buildings and the, the approach in evaluating those problems, you know, as far as you know, potential cash flow going forward than many, many, many other parameters that investors normally extensively utilize when they're making those decisions is completely different. So I, I can't agree with you more on that. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we know, we know that again, buying today, people are getting 20, 25, 35% discounts. So that immediately puts them in such a preferential position as opposed to where they were, you know, eight, nine months back before we got hit with all this uh, COVID-19, uh, you know, insanity between lockdowns and riots and what have you, that obviously have been triggering the exodus of the people, you know, from the city, you know, either it's residential properties or commercial properties that have been left behind. But now, obviously, it is a great opportunity to take advantage. We don't know how long it's going to last, federal, you know, state elections, sure. the local elections, but we would definitely need to hope and pray that things will get better. New York being such an incredible place, you know, huge concentration of, you know, from uh, you know, the companies, Fortune 500 companies from all over, you know, to residential real estate, where the people may be uh, full-time uh, presidents and citizens of uh, other countries outside of the U.S., but they would like to have something on a temporary basis as pied a terre or just, you know, 100% rental property. So that definitely will keep making New York marketplace extremely, extremely attractive. All right. Uh, I wanted to speak about... Yeah, I want to speak, Alex, about, uh, you know, your personalized approach in, in a few dealings that we have been, you know, discussing together in the past. I know that you offer a lot of other benefits as a boutique firm uh, over, you know, many other, you know, companies and brokers to that effect. Uh, you know, the real estate market is uh, way oversaturated, in my opinion. Uh, but, I mean, the clients, they gravitate towards, you know, great advice, not a salesperson, which is looking to close the deal, but really an advisor who can help them. Uh, you know, real estate represents a huge, you know, probably the most sizable asset in many, many, many people's lives. People do not accumulate that much funds, uh, you know, their retirement plans and any other kind of investment. So obviously they're looking for somebody who's going to spend some time and dig, you know, deep and dig in extensively to understand their personal needs. So, so I would like you to take our audience through the process, how you approach the client and how you walk them through, you know, every step of the process. Absolutely. I mean, we've always, our business, I think of our business more of a, of, uh, as a private advisor, private wealth advisor when, when it comes to real estate. And the consulting approach has always been uh, at the forefront of our, of our business um, um, business model. Um, and, I, and I do think that, um, especially in, in a day and age where everything is dominated by the internet, everything is public information. And uh, thank God, by the way, that, that that's the case because it, it really, we're a big fan of transparency. Uh, and that really allows for transparency, we always ask ourselves, how can add value to the client, right? And uh, what, we, what we do is we do a couple of things. Of course, in our consulting um, aspect of it, we don't just act as brokers, where it's finding uh, the property and make sure that the parameters are met, but we deal with the financing, with the insurance, with the legality. We have a team of people that we rely on and make sure that, um, you know, real estate has a lot of uh, boxes that you need to, to check, so to speak. And that has tremendous value, especially if you've done it in the past when you're advising a client, because um, they can, they can uh, you know, achieve a great deal on one end, but maybe being lacking on, on, on another aspect of the deal, which, which, um, which can, can provide risk on that end. And so we, we are able to, to really um, have a great um, coverage for the whole deal. Also property management is one as aspect that we cover for, for property owners, especially that they're not here. And we see that that's, uh, that's really, really important. So I would say in 2020, if we're looking at the market as a, uh, as a whole, especially the brokerage market or the real estate companies and consulting market, uh, it's been a tough year, truthfully. Um, you know, a lot of companies have gone out of business. A lot of uh, larger companies have been consolidating. I mean, you heard, uh, uh, you know, core corn and city habitats consolidated. Uh, Caliber was bought. There's, there's been a lot of a lot of companies went out of, out of, out of business, as you know. Uh, Compass had a setback, so there's a lot of uh, uh, you know movement right now, and uh, and it has to be. But I would say that a boutique business like like mine, where is more based on um, uh, productivity than than mass, uh, has been very easy for us to compete. The cost of marketing, the cost of competition, uh, our listings have. Uh, the same exposure than a, than a larger company listing. The reason for that is because everything is online now, social media, uh, listing sites, uh, entry barriers are very, very low. And that's, by the way, across any industry, not just real estate, but across any industry. And so we are seeing that a lot of these understanding that 
um, we're seeing that a lot of end customers are more and more inclined to um, considering brokerages more for the work that they do than for the name that they have and especially who they're working with within the brokerage. And I think that's a huge opportunity for a lot of individual brokers, a lot of smaller companies, and, uh, and it's tough for, for larger business, businesses to stay in business or to show profitability. A lot of them are showing losses. So I think this is a direction where a lot of the market is going. And um, I want to say also on, uh, on, um, on a market standpoint, um, we have been very active, especially in, uh, in advising clients. We are organizing, as you speak, a real estate fund. Uh, towards this opportunity that we talked about before, whether it's a multifamily. I mean, I personally bought a property last week myself and I'm looking to do two more with the winter, uh, through the winter, because it's a great time. So I would say that anybody that is interested even in, um, in investing um, um, a part of, of this and being part of a fund and to really explore these opportunities, we're seeing a lot of them right now. We're really, really active on the investment and development side of things, uh, which is a terrific time time to do so. And the last thing that I would say regarding, regarding this is that, to be, to be frank, Gene, I never thought in my lifetime that we would have such an opportunity when it comes to New York City. I mean, some people compare the current situation to the 70s, okay, as far as a lot of aspects. And to be able to buy at such a discount or such terrible uh, conditions, if, 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 if you are to, to scout the right deal, uh, I never thought in my lifetime we would have this this opportunity on the on the opportunistic side. This is the opportunistic side that I'm that I'm discussing, of course. Um, um, it was really unex uh, you, you couldn't expect that unless something like this would happen. So people that have some uh, cash on the side or or an opportunity, I, I don't know if forever will will happen in uh, in our lifetime. Truthfully, it is truly unprecedented, Alex, as you pointed out so correctly, but what makes uh, it different for different people and companies is how you accept this fact and how you act, uh, you know, hopefully proactive as opposed to, you know, otherwise. You mentioned some of, some of the biggest companies, not just in New York, but in the country, you know, Corker and Compass. Uh, I mean, they all went uh, through major, major processes, you know, call it consolidation, I call it shrinking, basically. Uh, you know, when you actually have been expanding your company, hiring new staff, hiring new, new agents. Uh, and uh, and uh, again, kudos to you. Obviously, you have the discipline. You have been able to, uh, you know, hold, uh, hold the fort, so to speak, and really uh, weather the storm uh, and then keep going, keep going. You know, when a lot of people, they just kind of like throwing the towel. Well, gee, I can't take it anymore. You know, it, it's just too depressing. So that, that's what really separates successful executives from from the rest of the pack. Uh, we know there's plenty of people that would like to think that they're successful, they would like to think that they're strong, they would like to think that they can really face and deal with a lot of issues and problems. Uh, but once they actually have to, to deal with them, not everybody can come out you know, strong and uh, with flying colors. You have done it, so you know, I definitely congratulate you on those, on those things. Uh, you have been expanding, as you pointed before, Alex. Uh, so my question would be, do you plan on expanding to the West Coast? Do you plan on building more business overseas in Europe, in the UK? I know you had some plans in the past. So, you know, in the light of uh, current developments, you know, how they've been affecting Absolutely those plans. Absolutely, yes. Sorry, I lost you for a second. Um, the answer is no absolutely yes. As I mentioned, uh, we are already very active in the New York market as well as Miami and Los Angeles market when it comes, uh, when it comes to the US. Um, right. Our next step as far as um, an office uh, that we are having the plans will be for London when it comes to Europe. We see London as the, uh, I call it the capital, while I call New York the capital of the world and definitely capital of America, I see London as the capital of Europe, so to speak, when it comes to a lot of different um, uh, things, you know, financials um, and uh, people traveling to London, probably the second uh, biggest, biggest city. So that's definitely our next step. Uh, we'll see what happens with this, uh, with this situation that we're in as far as the pandemic, but um, in the not too, not too distant future, that's definitely where we're going next. And then um, ideally we um, want to connect the main capital of the world um, in the real estate market arena. Uh, Dubai, Hong Kong, uh, those are other cities that we're really interested in where now we have buyers from and we are servicing uh, in the American market, but because of these connections, 
um, we would like to roll out uh, more plans of expansion in this market uh, in the years to come after London, because we do see great potential and great uh, opportunity for these cities to be uh, interconnected uh, for a variety of factors. And by the way, we do see that clients and investors that usually buy in New York, especially in the international arena, they usually have already interest and properties in the cities that I mentioned already, uh, whether it's London, whether it's again Dubai, whether it's Hong Kong. Uh, so there's a certain um, um, trade union there with the, with the different uh, cities that it's happening. And, and we simply, you know, follow the trend and, uh, and serve um, you know, uh, our, consulti uh, our consulting approach towards, towards that market. Those are, uh, those are uh, great cities, you know, London, Hong Kong. Uh, as you may know, Alex, I spent uh, just about eight years with Hong Kong Shanghai Bank Corp as a wealth manager. And I've been dealing very extensively with the clients from both London and Hong Kong. You know, obviously now the UK not being part of the European Union, they, they're stepping um, right. on a new path, you know, and going to the next stage. But uh, it was actually from my British clients uh, when I was still at HSBC that I've heard the term uh, nylon. I don't know if you've heard that. Uh, nylon NY stands for New York Land for London. So that's a new term that they clipped, you know, just talking about, you know, interaction between the two largest cities, uh, you know, across the pond, as they call it. And uh, with Hong Kong, if anything, I, I agree with you in that respect, because with, uh, you know, the mainland China uh, taking over more and more of Hong Kong, uh, you know, as a, as an independent, so to speak, territory, you know, more and more people in Hong Kong, they're getting uh, more and more anxious to take their assets out of Hong Kong before, you know, mainland Chinese government really takes over altogether. Uh, and they have some very valid concerns, in my opinion, uh, which is backed by what's happening down there. And they're moving more and more funds to, uh, you know, to other places, including but not limited to, you know, London and, and uh, New York and uh, pretty much all over across continental U.S. So totally agree in that respect. Uh, well, and by the way, I was going to add something more. Since we, we talked so well, you know, and, and gave so many good news about buyers, let me give also some... Uh, a fairly good news uh, to sellers as well because our poor sellers, you know, right. if I listen to this, they're not going to be too happy. But I would say we do have a lot of international clients that are ready, able, and willing to deploy capital in the United States as we speak, okay? They're being a little bit limited right now with the travel, okay? But I do hope, and I, I actually am certain that soon enough they'll be able to do so. But in the meantime, we've been able to do deals via Zoom, via video call, via, uh, you know, uh, via the internet, very, right. very effectively. So I would say that uh, New York is still considered, and it might as well, uh, even, even more so uh, at this time, uh, because of what's happening, a, a fantastic opportunity. So we're working actively and currently with, with, um, with international buyers that uh, are very interested in New York, and that could be a good thing, good thing for Sal for sure. Well, that's a, that's a great and positive news for the sellers and the international buyers. So I think on that positive note, Alex, we can uh, wrap it up. So um, I do want to thank you for coming to join us. Uh, you know, great and very informative uh, conversation. Hopefully our audience has learned, you know, some interesting information. Before we sign off, please state uh, how the people can get in touch with you for any kind of real estate needs. Absolutely. So the best way, uh, my email is alex at carinigroup.com. C A R I N as in N C I, that's my last name, or uh, any social media at Karini Group. You'll find me LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Instagram, all social media. Yeah. Just everything is on Google if you Google my name. I, I know you are very active all over, all over, uh, you know, the, the, the online, uh, you know, either it's Instagram or LinkedIn, and I'll make sure to post it in the in the description uh, section of this. Uh, of this segment. All right, Alex. So again, thank you very much. Congratulations to you for, uh, on all the great things happening to you professionally and personally. I, you know, I know, I know the family is doing very well. So, uh, you know, kudos Fantastic. and congratulations. Stay well, stay safe. And I hope sometime down the line, you can come and join us back again. All right. Thank you, Gene. Thank you, Gene, so much. And uh, appreciate it all your time and uh, uh, your great audience. And congratulations to you for this wonderful, wonderful uh, initiative. It's wonderful. You're very kind, Alex. Thank you so much. And folks, again, I uh, hope to see you next week. Our audience enjoyed. Stay well, stay safe. And uh, there, is the end, uh, there is the light at the end of the tunnel. So bad times will pass. You know, good people, strong people, they, they will overcome all the, all the issues, all the, program, uh, all the problems, and we will get better and stronger. And, and best wishes to our audience, all right?